Isn't it strange? People say things like, make peace, not war, and thus speak of peacemaking as if one can make peace, just as we build and make chairs or cars. But when it comes to actually constructing things that promote peaceful ways of living together, there's a lack of imagination, and the whole question seems terribly abstract. And isn't it strange that everyone wants sustainable development and everyone agrees that sustainability includes social factors and the idea of living together for a long time to come in peaceful ways? If you ask someone, how will you make things more sustainable, they will point to more resource efficient products, less wasteful gadgets and devices. It's easy for them. But what if you ask someone who likes to tinker with technical things and ask the question, how will you make things that promote peace and cooperative ways of living together? This is the question I want to answer today, and I want to answer it not for the industrial producers of tanks and guns, but for ordinary people who love to tinker and play and build things. There are lots of people out there who call themselves makers or hackers. They come together in maker spaces and follow the ideals of the do-it-yourself movement or the open source ideas of hackers. They believe that technology should be open and accessible to everyone. They believe that the users should also be the developers of technology and that the pursuit of profit can get in the way of sustainability. Let's see whether I can persuade them and you that through their, their tinkering, they can actually promote peace. Of course, I could do so by way of general arguments or by appealing to people's conscience. I might say, for example, that many makers are concerned about equal access to technology. If people become dependent on experts or international corporations for the purification of water, for the seeds they need to plant, or for their communication networks, this is likely to produce social conflict. Hackers and makers can contribute to the development of technologies which can be managed and maintained by citizens and the users themselves. They can design technical systems which foster cooperation when people work together in order to pr produce benefits for everyone. But I actually don't want to be too general or abstract. I want to provide examples which might inspire you to become involved and join in with hammer and nail with a plan or a project. Now, what are examples of tinkering for peace? The most famous example comes with a slogan that used to be very popular and is almost forgotten today. Swords to plowshares. In German, it is Schwerter zu Pflugscharen. And the Russian version, which is the most famous, I can't pronounce. It's a call to action. Take military technology and retool it, retrofit it, and turn it into something civilian. Not only swords, but also the tanks from World War I can become an agricultural technology, which does not kill people, but feeds them. You can see this on pictures of early tractors, which looked and moved like tanks. The slogan also worked when it came to using bomb shells for household appliances. And today we find artists who work guns into musical instruments. This retooling has an educational dimension as well. It shows that the things don't have to be as they are. They invite us to change and adapt them. A dangerous and destructive thing can be turned into a harmless and friendly tool. A highly competitive shooter game might be reprogrammed to become a cooperative game in which you can only win by working together. Once a military boot, now a flower pot. This kind of tinkering does not require high-tech instruments or skills. Any makerspace provides the necessary tool. A room in the basement is enough to take a bunch of children's toy guns and transform them into a whimsical water fountain. This is one kind of tinkering for peace. It is a design practice like many others in that it incorporates public values. Some design practices are dedicated to efficiency or sustainability, others to user friendliness or to principles of justice and fair trade. And of course, every new design is looking to improve something, to make it better. This is true also for the playful examples of refashioning military things. They make the world better by reminding us that some technologies induce or heighten conflicts, while other technologies 
bring people together. But there are other kinds of tinkering of, uh, for peace, other things that ordinary citizens can do with some ingenuity and limited technical means. There is what we might call critical reverse engineering. Take a familiar device like a smartphone, e-bike, or frying pan and analyze how it was put together, where its components came from, how materials were extracted, what kind of conflicts arose along the supply chain until it arrives at our homes. We might discover, for example, that batteries are much improved through the incorporation of rare earth elements and that the extraction of these elements creates considerable environmental damage, poses a hazard to the health of workers, and requires so much water that it compromises water quality for the local population. While less pure elements would result in a loss of performance, we might still prefer a not-so-perfect product from recycled elements. This kind of technical analysis exposes the potential conflicts that are hidden within the supply chains of products. It can point out alternatives, and perhaps it can take first steps towards a redesign. Again, it also has an educational dimension in that it, simply, it teaches us not to simply accept technologies, but to interrogate them and to question ourselves as well. Is power and speed and efficiency really so important, or should we prefer electronic devices that are more qual uh, compatible with the quality of lives here and in faraway countries? Now, of course, critical reverse engineering is not usually powerful enough to develop and market better smartphones, e-bikes, or frying pans. And yet, it might prepare the ground for them. And in some cases, it succeeds at a local level to loosen the control of co global corporations and to create local networks. This ha it has in common with the third type of tinkering for peace, namely a kind of prototyping and speculative discovery of what citizens might actually need. For example, everyone talks about drones that will be used not to coordinate rescue teams, but for the delivery of parcels and a general increase of drone traffic in our cities. Those might be civilian drones that are used for peaceful purposes. And yet, they might induce a feeling of helplessness and surveillance. The people on the ground might not be happy at all with all those objects hovering above their heads in somewhat menacing ways. Short of prohibiting these drones, is there a technology that could transform a situation of potential conflict into one of empowerment and cooperation? Perhaps there are ways of including citizens in the regulation and monitoring and even policing of urban airspace. This could be done by way of an app which allows ordinary people to identify drones, to verify their mission, and to report violations. To identify the need for such an app and perhaps to develop a prototype cannot happen in isolation, however. Citizen scientists in makerspaces would have to seek out conversations with manufacturers of drones, with politicians and regulators with urban planners and neighborhood organizations. Here, not only the envisioned product, but the design process itself promotes peaceful cooperation. And if you're keeping count, here is a fourth way of tinkering for peace. It can be found in the makerspaces themselves and how people work together in these spaces. To appreciate this, let's remember what the first makerspaces looked like, well before they became fashionable under that name. These were the so-called amateur or ham radio clubs, which orig originated in the late 19th century in the early years of the radio. Many of them still exist today. These clubs organized networks for emergency communi communication. They experimented with the reception and transmission of radio signals, including long-wave radio, allowing them to make contact not so much with alien species, but with crackling sounds and the broken up voices of radio operators in remote regions of the Earth, but also to pick up distress signals from ships in the sea. These clubs built a local cooperative, not unlike a volunteer fire department, but they also brought the whole world into the narrow horizon of their local communities. They formed a community that designs well together as such a kind of model for other designers who want to be open to the world. Today we can imagine citizen researchers who work with refugees to develop tools for water purification, 
that can address some of the causes of migration. Accordingly, to tinker for peace might also consist in this, to showcase a collective design process that is responsive to the interests and needs of local users. And especially when it comes to a shared concern for safe operation and for maintaining a secure environment, the work of citizen scientists in makerspaces can provide a model for engineering at large. It shows how responsibility can be shared within a culture of safe building and controlling and using technology. Finally then, citizen scientists can tinker for peace by using simple devices for the collection of data that no one else cares to look at. Simply by tracking movements of planes at major airports, citizens have been able to pinpoint illicit military operations. This is only one kind of monitoring activity. Most public universities, for example, are committed to the pursuit of peaceful technologies, peaceful research. But how closely do they adhere to these standards? How well do they handle the questions of dual use and possibly destructive applications of their findings? Since most makerspaces interact with university research in their cities, they are well positioned to scrutinize it. So here we have some, a lot of the ways that citizen scientists, hackers, builders and makers can work for the promotion of peace. As we at the Janus Peace Lab set out to promote and support tinkering for peace, there is no lack of examples to fuel the imagination. But one might still ask why this should be so important in the age of global warming, uh, environmental pollution, resource depletion. Shouldn't we be focusing primarily on questions of efficiency, recycling, safety? Why all this emphasis on technology and support of peaceful ways of living together? Why this emphasis on promoting global public goods of sharing planetary resources? There's a short answer and many long answers to this question. The quick answer must be, go must be good enough for now. It's not just that peace is important and that it becomes ever more important at a time when technical systems become ever more complex and vulnerable with attacks on privacy and infrastructure that we are not always aware of. In a state of uncertainty and vulnerability, the idea of a peaceful world provides a positive outlook, a sense of direction. Playful exploration of fun ideas gain a sense of purpose. This is of value not just for the makers and hackers themselves and for innovations here and there, but for society at large. Academic and corporate engineers tend to look for optimal solutions, for perfect designs. Ordinary citizens have learned to deal with uncertainty and vulnerability in different ways, in a piecemeal fashion, using a patchwork of approaches, none of them perfect, but altogether pretty effective. This is a kind of intelligence which is needed today, which thrives on cooperation, which builds a secure environment, which invites goodwill and mutual trust. When these citizens become engineers or designers in peace labs, hackerspaces, repair cafes, do-it-yourself workshops, they are indeed at the forefront of engineering for peace.